and welcome to our lecture on Native American Arts and Culture Practice in America with John Hayworth. My name is Isha Vyas, and I'm the division head in the Office of Arts and History in Middlesex County. Before we get started, I'd just like to remind you that we do have the assistive listening system in place here. So if you're interested, uh, you could get the receiver from the table outside. This program has been brought to you by the Middlesex County Board of Chosen Freeholders and the Rutgers University Libraries. This has been a wonderful collaboration with the library and there are several people I'd like to thank for their assistance and patience in, bringing, in organizing this event. First of all, Ron Becker. Uh, he is Professor Emeritus, Rutgers University Libraries and the Chairman of the Middlesex County Cultural and Heritage Commission, which is the commission that is from, that, that we um, support us. Chriselyn Maloney, the Vice President of Information Services and University Librarian. Dee Magnoni, who's here, Assistant Vice President for Information Services and Director of New Brunswick Libraries. Jessica Pellian, Director of Communications, Rutgers Libraries. Christine Lutz, who's also here. Um, she's a New Jersey Regional Studies Librarian and, and Head of Public Services, Special Collections and University Libraries. And I'd also like to thank Rhonda Marker, William Puglisi, James Hartstein, Charlene Hauser, Nancy Martin for their assistance in bringing this program. From our team at the Office of Culture and Heritage, of, of Office of Arts and History, we have Michael Moran, who's here. Eva Walters, that you met outside, and Mary Gismondi. The Office of Arts and History provides arts and history programs and grants, Native American programs, folk life programs, and other educational programs. So to learn more of what we do, you can text the word culture to 56512 to access our mobile website, and you can learn all about our different programs. Now I'd like to invite Dee McNoney to to share some remarks on behalf of the Rutgers Libraries. Thank you. My remarks are going to be very brief. You can see it truly takes a village. <laughs> and um, thank you to all of you for coming tonight. Um, you are in New Brunswick Libraries, Alexander Libraries specifically. And um, I have now been here six weeks. So I am the, the new kid on the block, um, but I'm a returning kid. I, while I have been out of New Jersey for 31 years, my family's been here since the 1700s. So we're from New Jersey, right off Hose Lane. <laughs> um, but I am very happy to be here in New Jersey, again, here at Alexander Library, in charge of the New Brunswick Libraries, the staff and the faculty are wonderful here and working with them has been tremendous, um, as has been our partnership. And so I'm very excited tonight to um, be here and listen to John. I've come from New Mexico where we had a very rich um, Native American culture and um, tonight's talk is particularly interesting to me. So welcome and thank you. I'll turn it back over. So in June, I was in San Francisco attending the Americans for the Arts conference, their annual conference, and I had the opportunity to speak to John Hayworth, who was also attending as a board member of the Americans for the Arts. And I invited him to present a lecture for us and was so pleased when he accepted. Mr. Hayworth has served for over two decades as a senior executive and director of the Smithsonian National Museum of American Indian in New York. Currently, he serves on the boards of Americans for the Arts and Surplus and on the Public Arts Network Council. Previously, he served on the faculty of NYU, New York University, and has been the assistant commissioner of New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. He has written exclusively about contemporary native arts and related topics, and remains active as a speaker, writer, and advisor. And he also is a member of the Cherokee. Right? So please join me all in welcoming Mr. John Hayworth. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for that kind in introduction. And uh, oh, now you see, <laughs> I'm pushing buttons already. I just got here. Um, let's move that back. Uh, I want to thank the Middlesex uh, County Cultural and Heritage uh, Commission and Isha, thank you, and, and Mike and the staff. It's just been great to work with. And I'm so glad that there's a collaboration with Rutgers University and with this library. I'm proud to be here. In fact, it's such an honor for me. I, I want to actually dedicate uh, my remarks tonight uh, to my first cousin, uh, Margaret Verbal, who is a, is a really exceptional novelist. And uh, in 2016, for her novel Maud's Line, she was one of the uh, two runners-up for the Pulitzer Prize in Fiction. And in that novel, my cousin Margaret wrote about my own family's heritage and the history of allotment lands in northeastern Oklahoma and set in the year 1928. And I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, my, our cousin, Earl Boyd Pierce, who was a fierce advocate and lawyer on behalf of the Cherokee people in eastern Oklahoma uh, for the Arkansas River rights. And he fought that all the way in the court system, and that really made a big difference to uh, the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Uh, there certainly are some serious issues that we could consider in talking about Native American arts and culture. Certainly, the topic of stereotypes in sports teams is one of those top issues, as is the politics surrounding the pipeline and all of the environmental issues that American Indian people have faced throughout this hemisphere and in the world, uh, including uh, Native Alaskan villages that have literally had to move hundreds of miles in, inland because their, their communities have melted in the Arctic. Uh, we could also discuss language and cultural survivor, survival issues, which are very profound and have great and deep meanings. And I want to put all of this in a broader context because as we read in the newspapers and hear on the news almost every day, the identity politics are under attack. So anything that is culturally specific or culturally grounded is up for review and criticism by the national media and even elected officials, as is the whole concept of affirmative action in our country. So those ideas of cultural equity and economic justice and social justice are all issues that are in our faces every day of our lives, if we're paying attention. And of course, in the issue of global migration, which is a profound and complicated topic, but I'm, I remember in working with some of the native communities in this hemisphere, there are uh, trans, uh, transnational native people that are migrating from Latin America to our country. There are, uh, there are literally reservation and homeland communities that uh, cross uh, either the U.S. and Mexico, and they, uh, the border is not really part of their border. And the same thing on Six Nations in, in uh, upstate New York and in Canada. But my topic tonight will be far more narrow cast my re remarks or a reflection on my 21-year career at the National Museum of the American Indian and my experiences over many years in the cultural sector, having worked in senior positions at local and state arts agencies and my service on the Americans for the Arts Board of Directors. In my work at the museum, I had the opportunity to work closely with Native American national and tribal organizations and with Native contemporary artists, both artists working in a traditional realm and passing along long-standing traditions from their communities in their art practice, as well as Native artists working in, the, in contemporary art making, both work that's focused on social commentary and the issues of our times, environmental and social and economic justice issues, and the political, often fiercely contested issues, as well as art making that focuses on the formality of just making art uh, that isn't so much about commentary or the concept. Uh, and I think this realm of native art in public art installations, uh, in uh, museum galleries, and this has been something that I'm very proud of the history of the National Museum of the American Indian, which has helped foster and build a field of practice. 
In terms of cultural practice and what that means in general terms, Native communities value the authority of elders as cultural bearers who bring so much to the table, both philosophically and in practical terms. The value of community and hospitality, of being deeply grounded, rooted in community-based work, anchors their contributions. And I found that in my experience over the years, this has had a profound, uh, a profound effect on the conversation and the discourse in Native communities and beyond. I think about what was in flashing on the news just today. There was an amazing article in the New York Times about uh, in New Zealand, and it was about this Disney film, and I'll probably mispronounce it, Moana. I'm sure you, all of you who have young children know this. But what they did is they they uh, put this film in the Maori language, and the article's conclusion in today's New York Times, September 17th, 19th, uh, 2017, was that the headline was, It Bolsters Indigenous Language. And it's very fascinating for me, because I've written on the topic of protecting uh, indigenous languages and the complexity of doing that, and there are many institutions and leaders who are doing so much in that, and I never thought of how important it is to see this being done in the popular culture and actually uh, affecting young people, teenagers and younger, in this. But also as a coincidence of the day, and I'm sure when we all go home this evening and tune in to the late night news, we'll see the headlines of what happened uh, at the United Nations. But stepping back from that uh, debate and that gathering at the UN today, one of the things that I'm reminded of is that the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues is one of the most important international organizations bringing global attention to indigenous issues. Uh, in establishing the Permanent Forum, which was no easy trick, let me tell you, it took decades to do this, it was a long struggle and a lot of hard work on behalf of many people around the world, but in particular, the native leaders from our region, and in particular, Onondaga leaders like Tanya Frickner and uh, Oren Lyons, himself referred to as a faith keeper and deeply respectful of an indigenous worldview, including the stewardship of the natural world and the environment, and other native uh, leaders in our regions played key roles in the establishment of the permanent forum. As an aside, my dear friend, Tanya Frickner, who died a few years ago, she confided in me the fact that she thought that all of her hard work over decades of a lifetime's work, she never thought it would come to fruition, but it finally did. And one of the things that was both an irony and sad part of this story, although it did get established as a permanent forum, was that the holdout countries were Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. And how unusual, how ironic, that these are the four nations in the world that have uh, significant native populations. So with that indigeneity at play and how important it is, and I'll talk a little bit more about the, the permanent forum uh, in, in my remarks later. I want to do this quick uh, PowerPoint presentation that's the building that I worked, uh, worked in for 21 years. It's the old U.S. Custom House in Lower Manhattan. And uh, I'm going to see if I can do the little laser pointer here, if I can be skilled enough, and I clearly am not. Uh, but you'll see the monumental Daniel Chester French sculpture in front of the building. And I think in this, um, and I'm not here to make a conclusion or add to the uh, to the conversation about uh, public art and the monument wars that are currently at play. But I look at these ideas that were created by arguably one of the most important sculptors in our nation's history, Daniel Chester French, and you have very stereotypical representations in sculpture of the four continents of, of Asia, the Americas, Europe, and you can't see the one of Africa quite so well in, in this, this image. Uh, we were dealing with the complexity of such issues and being in a grand and glorious rotunda inside this very building that has larger-than-life portraits of the European explorers like Christopher Columbus and Henry Hudson. You can imagine 
the complexity of being in a building that is, uh, that is the home of a Native American institution and dealing with daily reminder of Christopher Columbus and all that's embedded in that uh, piece of the history. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to another way of doing this. Having technical bad luck, so you know something. That's okay. Mike will fix the day. I'm gonna just continue. <laughs> this is, I always try to be the worst. Aha! This okay, great. So just use these. Okay, great, perfect, perfect. I knew there was a solution. Um, the National Museum of the American Indian moved the great George Gustav High collection from a warehouse facility in the Bronx created this just glorious cultural resource center in Suitland, Maryland, which is suburban Washington, D.C., to house the collection. But it was also a place, a gathering place, for tribal members to come and investigate and look and research their own cultural material. What was interesting is that the organization, the collection, this may seem like a small matter, but it's not. It's huge. The collection had been organized by type of object. So all the baskets were together, all the pots were together. It was kind of put in this, in the traditional historic material in that way. At the Cultural Resource Center, the cultural material is organized by tribal. So, so then when a tribe comes to see all of their cultural material, they can really uh, delve deeper into the collection and learn their own histories of, uh, on that. Okay. Going on the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. This opened in the year uh, 20, uh, 2004. The, the facility in New York opened in the year uh, 1994. And I want to give you just a little bit of the history of that <clears throat> because an anniversary is coming up yet again. It opened on October 30th, 1994. Now, some of you a few of you are old enough to remember the Clinton administration. I think most people in the room, right? Okay, this was in the year of the midterm elections, and literally, literally, the next week was that national election, and that was the ascendancy of Newt Gingrich and the contract with America. And literally, to the day, 90 days after the opening of the High Center in Lower Manhattan with great fanfare, 90 days to the day, there were members of Congress calling for the, um, for the director and the senior curator of the National Air and Space Museum to be fired because of the, how the, uh, the uh, Enola Gay was being uh, interpreted as one of a significant historic artifact that was also uh, was used in the weaponry in, in response in World War II. This was a very complicated piece of American history, but it was also a very complicated piece of museum history because at the time, the national, the Smithsonian was working to engage different constituencies in different communities from multiple perspectives to tell a richer and fuller and more dynamic story of the artifact. The idea being that every artifact has the context of place and space and community and lots of other factors than merely through the aesthetic lens. And that became, uh, I believe, in looking back on it, and it will take many more, many more decades to really get the interpretive fix on this, but I believe that that had some effect on how we interpreted our work. As foreground to the establishment and the opening of the National Museum of the American Indian was the opening of the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Now, this is also a, a museum with a very complicated narrative and also a museum. How many have been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington? So you know it. There's something about the narrative there that is to make the ordinary extraordinary. The experience with the ordinary extraordinary. So you're seeing a room full of shoes and you know what the meaning of the shoes are from knowing this history and how you 
experience, that museum. And some of the leadership from the, uh, from the Holocaust Museum actually were hired and worked at the National Museum of the American Indian. And one of the things that we did as a cultural practice in establishing the museum was to do extensive consultation work throughout all of Indian country to get the best advice of how should we interpret this museum, how should we go forward. And the general, and I'm making it a little simpler than it is in reality, but basically there have been institutions and prominent academics, scholars and writers in, in our country and throughout the world that had looked at the perspective of cultural material from an outsider perspective. So there, was, there were anthropologists and archaeologists and art historians who were essentially cultural outsiders who went into indigenous communities to do research. And not that that, that was all bad, but it was not all good. So the idea that really, uh, really spurred us on to do our work and the approach that we developed and part of the cultural practice was listening to a core constituency which had been defined by an act of Congress signed by the president, which was basically that this was a national institution. And just as a quick thumbnail sketch on this, this had been a New York, New York City-based, New York-based institution that was at 155th Street and Broadway at Audubon Terrace in New York City, and there was a, a collection storage facility in the Bronx. And basically, that was an institution, I'm giving you the real short story on this, but they ran into financial and ethical and other, other uh, complexities of the time, and then it was like, what are we going to do? How will we be stewards of this great collection. And they began to bring on more Native American people onto the, onto the governance. And at the t same time, there was a groundswell, I believe, in the 1980s that led to the congressional um, uh, legislation in 1989 that called for the establishment of the National Museum of the American Indian. Just as a small aside, it was only one year earlier that the Native American Gaming Act was passed and pairing with the establishment of the National Museum of the American Indian, the Legislative Act, was the, uh, also the establishment of the repatriation, the NAGPRA legislation. So it's all kind of a period where there were lots of things happening. And what was being considered on a more narrow basis in New York City, and I know because I was working at the time at the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the official position of the city was that the best solution was to have this collection be folded into the great institution, the American Museum of Natural History on Central Park West and 78th Street. And that was certainly something that was considered. There was also under consideration was there was a very wealthy Texan, Ross Perot, he ran for president, I think many people in this room have heard of him. And Ross Perot actually made a very generous financial offer to relocate the collection and the institution to Dallas, Texas. The one that won out was actually the movement to have it become part of the Smithsonian. But at the time, the Smithsonian also has, and still does, has the National Museum of Natural History, and that certainly was the easiest uh, administrative option, managerial option for the Smithsonian, but there was a groundswell of advocacy and work that was going on in Native American communities that says we really need to have a separate institution. And I think that it's fascinating, I would uh, call attention for all of us to take close looks at the establishment of the African American History and Cultural Museum in Washington, which is at the far other end of the mall from where this building is located, because it's in those two narratives of arguably what was the genocide of Native American people and the history of slavery and that complexity that really are the bookends, literally, to our, our country's tough history and culture. And I think that it behooves both of these institutions as great cultural institutions to tell deeper truths in the story of these remarkable, often harsh histories in our country. 
I wanted to show some of the vitality of the institution. This is Native Hawaiian dancers in front of the uh, museum, just uh, there. Here's another with great fanfare and very large urban audience there. Um, and you can get a little closer look at the Daniel Chester Finch there. Um, there's, this is uh, from one of the music programs that we had at the uh, museum. I, I show you these particular images because the idea of cultural expression goes way beyond just presenting exhibits in a museum and doing something rather old-fashioned in that regard, but rather bringing vitality to the idea that Native people are alive and well today and that uh, are doing their best to hold on to traditions and practice, and that's so important. This is part of the Day of the Dead uh, celebration. Uh, I was very proud to have taken a lead role in presenting the uh, Choctaw choreographer, Tom Pearson, who has a remarkable career. And this, is, this dance piece is very airborne, and I just love it. It's in the, in the rotunda of, uh, of, of, of the building, of the Custom House. And one of the things that the choreographer Tom Pearson did, he used the convention of um, sign language, according to the Boy Scout manual, as a gestural vocabulary for having a conversation with the uh, European explorers that, whose portraits surround this room. So the idea of somehow talking in dance through dance, communicating through dance about this piece of history was a kind of a reminder of the complexity of that, but also the kind of resilience and the artistic expression that came with that. So I thought that was great. I wanted to show you an exhibit called Infinity of Nations and um, these, uh, these glorious headdresses that are in the, in the case there, they come from each of 10 geographic regions of uh, where we have <clears throat> elaborate collection material. And one of the things that was very deliberate about this exhibit, uh, while we certainly have many of the feathered headdresses from the plains in the collection, we wanted to bring to the public's eye a different kind of expression. And so we wanted to contextualize and actually show off the collection in its historic roots. So the very elaborate female feather headdress in the center is from the Brazilian Amazon, but next to it, and you can't really, this, this image, this, this slide doesn't really give full justice to this, but there is a small Peruvian uh, hat that was created in, I believe, the year 600. So it was to show the breadth and depth and uh, geographic expanse and also the remarkable and deep history of this. The idea of a infinity of nations was also in a way to present the material evidence to the idea to debunk the idea that this was North America or even South America was a wilderness for the taking, that it was an empty land with no people that there were actually very sophisticated uh, cultural practice and economic practice and social practice in, in, in an infinity of nations. That they were really, in fact, prior to the establishment of the United States as a country, there were sovereign native nations that had their own formal diplomatic ties with European nations. So without being hammering the visitor with the message, it was clear that here was the material evidence that debunked the idea that this was a wilderness for the taking, and that there were actually people that were already here. And I think this is a lesson in a global context, wherever we look in the world, to kind of imagine there are no empty places. And so there are people that were there. I think that these stories are told through a remarkable collection. And I'm also proud of the fact that throughout this collection, because <clears throat> there was a lot of controversy in the museum field about interpretation, including using touch screens and using, and even now, you know, uh, 
having having visitor experiences so you can bring your iPad or your iPhone or whatever. I don't mean to do plugs only for Apple products, but anyway, uh, uh, there is something about the encounter with the authentic, of really the encounter with real objects and contextualized so that it's not just a beauty show of through the aesthetics perspective, but rather it's put in the full context of the community where this work was created in the first place and how it was used in ceremonial practice and in religious expression and in all sorts of ways that had value and cultural meaning to the community itself. This is another view uh, of the inside of that gallery. Uh, this, is an this is an exhibit with some 800 uh, different objects from uh, the entire hemisphere. For uh, this New York region, we certainly have a lot of tourists from all over the world and from all over this country. But for our local audiences in the tri-state region, having material from the subarctic and from the Arctic and from uh, the lower part of the most southern part of the hemisphere was very important because it's not cultural material that people have the opportunity to see very often. So showing that, and we also, we, we started the exhibit where you enter this journey of geography, you're entering from the southernmost point. Uh, and in the center of this, we had those very elaborately decorated uh, hides from from the, from the plains. And what I found to be remarkable, because our cultural interpreters and educators could certainly work on this idea, but within steps, literally steps, three or four steps away from the glorious buffalo hides that were from the collection, there were also ledger drawing books that actually, after there was an attempt to eradicate not only the people but the buffalo, and so the switch from buffalo to horse culture, in very general terms, but where the ledger books of military officers became the medium and the venue for people to make art. They weren't making as much on the hides, but they were making it on paper and books. And that, to me, expresses cultural exchange and cultural continuity and a very complicated history in and of itself of taking uh, different objects of different of different types of, of artistic material and 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 making to uh, make that point. There is actually the example of the hide I was telling you about, and it's fascinating to me because the more Victorian wedding dress. This is from. Um, it is. This is. Uh, this is a dress worn by a woman, native woman, who was married to uh, a native leader in Nebraska. And they were resisting the forcible removal out of their homeland. They were going to be removed into Indian territory, which later became Oklahoma. So this cultural history of these artifacts and the people that their stories are illuminated through these artifacts becomes a really important piece of, of, of information for our visitors. I also find that <clears throat> this is the kind of exhibit that people can go through, and there's a lot, as, as, as some of my friends in the contemporary art world call it, there's a lot of eye candy. There's a lot of really extraordinary things to look at in the exhibit. So you can do this on just that level but if you just go the extra step, you can go to deeper and deeper levels of cultural information and history and, and, and understanding of very complicated uh, cultural moments. This is from a Robert Davidson exhibit. Robert Davidson is a Haida contemporary artist. Uh, if you travel to the Vancouver airport, you can see some of his great public installations. What he did, he was uh, from the Haida community, which to give you a sense of this, this would be a two hour flight north of Seattle. So Haida Gwaii has the second largest rainforest in the hemisphere after the Amazon. And so his parents' generation was the generation 
of, of children that were removed from their families and put into residential schools in Canada. There was later a public apology for that by the Canadian government. But in the, in the process, these very elaborate uh, totem poles and carving work was basically decimated. So the generation, there was this so cultural loss of this. What Robert and his brother did at age 19 and 22, they went back home, they spent lots of time with their grandparents' generation, and they learned from the beginning how to make the poles and carve the poles. And Robert Davidson, who is respected both as very much for his work in traditional arts, but also he's making incredible statements about the culture continuity. And I found it was remarkable because not only was he, is he a great carver and his production work of finding the right tree in his region for this, but for him to have this cultural practice, he went back to the community because he, he had to learn the songs. And in order to sing the songs and play the songs, he had to learn how to make the drums that would animate the songs. He had to learn those songs from his grandparents. He had to swim with the salmon, and he had to understand the culture from a deeper and ever deeper level. What I found was working with this um, incredible man, and I had the honor of, I co-curated this exhibit that opened in the Seattle Art Museum when he came to New York. And I'm very proud, this is one of my proudest moments of my entire career, because I got to work directly with Robert. But the thing that was also remarkable was that the Seattle Art Museum, which is an incredible, nationally significant museum, they privileged this exhibit, and instead of putting it off into the Native Gallery, they put it in the prominent uh, location of the contemporary art gallery of the Seattle Art Museum. And this was really, I found to be quite significant that they had that curatorial um, excellence to do that and to do something to move their institution in a new direction. So I felt that was really an important part of it. And getting to know Robert was really exciting. There's more of the exhibit. Uh, you will notice one of the things I make and for those of you in the art history field and who studied painting or sculpture, you'll, you'll recognize the whole muscular development of, of what's required of a carver to make this kind of work and, and that gesture of removing the wood to create this. And then what's required of painting and what is, what is embedded in that practice and how Robert did that. And one thing I learned from him is that he had to take a complete break. If he had been working on sculpture and totems, he had to take a complete break before he could really be prepared to do the paintings and vice versa. So the practice of it, he really incorporated the uh, geometric uh, effects of the, of the cultural symbols of his culture and all of the animals and all the cultural practice embedded in that work uh, and then made it in the most extraordinary uh, sense of color and, and design and everything that was included in there. There's another one of those books. Um, another exhibit that I got to work on was on <clears throat> Horace Pulau's photography. And Horace Pulau was a, was a, this was a very interesting and complicated period in, in history, but also in Native American history, and that's mid-century. 20th century, and partly this is this is a man whose family lived in Anadarko, Oklahoma, and he was a local photographer who did high school graduations and wedding pictures. He did a lot of documentary work, whether it was of uh, funerals and ceremonies in his community. But it was the moment, and I would I would encourage everyone here to go see the uh, photography exhibit at your museum on this campus. It is absolutely extraordinary. And some of the photographers who are working contemporaneously uh, with Horace Pulau are represented in that work, in, in this exhibit, right on this campus. So don't miss that. But the point of this was, this was a period 
And Native people also were facing modernity between the two world wars. And in the 1930s, the technology of airplanes and cars and everything else that was also sweeping the country, sweeping the world, was part of, the, of what was in the camera lens and what we documented in the world. Uh, I think that this was a significant because the counterpoint and the point we made in the exhibition was the contrast from some of the extraordinary WPA artists that were documenting and the idea that this is a group of Indians from western Oklahoma in Anadarko in very tough times of the Dust Bowl and after Indian removal and the movement of the southeastern tribes to Oklahoma and the complicated history of the establishment of the state of Oklahoma in 1907. But here is a photographer who has actually had agency, really was expressing his people with a sense of confidence and success and empowerment. And that, to me, was a remarkable piece of this history because one of the stereotypes is to place Indians in marginalized positions. And so I think sometimes speaking uh, on this term really makes that happen. I care a lot about the whole topic of peace education and reconciliation work. This is a complicated dialogue because the curriculum for developing peace education, doing coursework and having practical experiences that really are a remedy. Is it done through truth and reconciliation interviews? Is the work done in a kind of social work frame? How is the practice done? Because talking in line about peace education and then having the kind of experiences to live it out and figure out what's going to work of being a peacemaker is no small task, as we all know. This was <clears throat> Nadia Mir's work in this gallery. She is a Canadian artist, and she encouraged a kind of art-making practice with visitors from the public. So she would have these one-foot, 12-inch uh, uh, by 12-inch uh, panels, that uh, canvases, and then she would use the techniques of, of weaving and sewing on this work and she would work with the public in a very interactive um, experience, immersive experience, so that they could deal with some very difficult narratives in their own personal lives. And so some people, because the museum is so close to nine, the 9-11 attacks, there are people in New York who are still recovering, even to this day, from that, that chapter in our history. But many others were dealing with profoundly complicated family circumstances and seeing this woman work because it was not only to express something visually through this craft, but also to write about it. And so uh, I find that in just one maybe small way, this was a way to address uh, some complexities in people's lives and the struggles that they're having with that. I think this takes the whole practice of art making way beyond uh, selling work in a gallery, as important as that is to artists, or being commissioned to do a public art installation. This is really a really incredible part of a social practice that's not exclusive to the Native community, but certainly an important part of the practice within. Here's a closer view of that. You can see a little bit in the background some of the works that were created out of this workshop. There's another two walls of this. I think sometimes in a lot of contemporary artwork that is certainly high, highly conceptual and it's, it's idea, uh, it takes a little bit of decoding, it takes a little bit of risk taking, it takes a lot of fortitude to be able to do this practice as an artist, but ultimately I think the result of this and the documentation of this work was uh, profoundly important. important not only to the direct participants, but to the audience that, that came and read about it in the galleries. Uh, we did an elaborate exhibition on um, native dresses. And 
this work, we also worked with different Native communities to develop it, and the curator, Emil Hermini Horses, uh, curated the show. And one of the, uh, one of the sections, which I, I don't have an image to show you tonight, but one of the sections was of the ghost dance. And so there were literally dresses that had uh, bullet holes in them. And talk about being emotionally uh, draining to some, some of our visitors. We had to also be very careful in how this work was presented to the public and have a kind of disclaimer on this. And really through uh, the interpretation and signage and the installation of the work, how to do this because it was uh, absolutely fascinating to see this kind of work. The personal story, the takeaway for me, is that for a whole host of reasons, a lot having to do with the school year, some having to do with the Jewish holidays, some having to do with the calendar of the exhibition itself, and the only time, the only day that we could find to open this very exhibit was on September 11th, 2008. And I think about what that, to that, you know, what September 11th means. But also think about that is also, I mentioned another election earlier in my talk, but this is right before Obama was elected president in November of that year. What had happened, there were already Native American warriors who lost their lives in, uh, in the Iraqi conflict. So for this exhibition, we had the Kiowa War Mothers from Oklahoma come to the museum. And this was remarkable because it's few times that women actually wore the headdresses of the plains, because it usually was men. The women would uh, historically would would do an honor dance and singing at the top of their lungs to bereave and to honor the returning warriors, the returning soldiers to their community. And that practice was so important to them. And of course, in this conflict, there were both men and women coming back from the battleground. But for over an hour, this is a lower Manhattan institution and we had the opening, and they sang their hearts out and danced in the rotunda for over an hour. We lost very few members of the audience. Everybody was there, heart and body, with this, this practice. And that's how we opened up. We felt like people could look at the dresses in the exhibit, but to contextualize this into a larger story, and the, uh, the parallels between showcasing the dances of the ghost dance and, just as an aside, these are highly significant cultural material. And our protocol at the National Museum of the American Indian was to get the full community approval before we wanted their advice on how should we show this? Are you comfortable with us showing it? And in getting that and having uh, Native advisors to the exhibit, it really made a huge difference. But the combination of the uh, ghost dance dresses and having the Kiowa War, War Mothers was just really profound. I wanted to give a sense of the sense of celebration. You know, everything is so somber and so chivalrous. And this is the altar of the day, day of the Dead, which is an annual tradition at the National Museum of the American Indian. And uh, it's, it's uh, quite, uh, it's on the cultural calendar. So it's usually on October 30th or 31st or November 1st, but it's around that, whatever the weekend, however the weekend falls. I had mentioned earlier about the, um, about the ledger drawings. And uh, I, this is quite a remarkable, I think, just as a drawing, it's interesting to me, but it's also remarkable because of the con content and the context of what, what it is and the fact that it was in a military journey. This is, um, you may have heard recently, there's been spectacular reviews of a, of a movie that's going around, an independent movie, um, and I urge everybody to see it. Uh, it is based on the contributions that 
uh, Native American musicians have had on rock, pop, and jazz music in our country. And this is part of, of, of an exhibit that we did um, at, the, at the museum that we can also be very contemporary in dealing pop culture and not everything that is just in, um, in a historic frame. I wanted to show you, just as a matter, because the topic was cultural practice, in our film and media department at the National Museum of American Indian, we know that there are stories that young people in particular, but community members, tribal members throughout the hemisphere, but particularly in South America, that when they had, we had a program called Video in the Villages, and so there were young people that had profoundly important stories to talk, tell about elders in their communities, about the environment, and, and documenting that in their communities, and what that was about, and empowering young people with this. I'm drawn again, I got a lot of inspiration from going to the Campus Museum here today, because there was work that Rutgers, that, that the museum is doing with teenagers from this area, to have their photography be shown in a museum. And I so applaud that because I think we did a similar practice at, at NMAI in the video in the villages and showed some of these uh, film programs there. This I think is just incredible. This was an iconic image that was used in the cover of the program book for the film festival that we did for many, many years did a lot of cross-cultural work. There was a Native art artist, Jason Lujan, who wanted to work with, uh, with artists from Chinatown and do cross-cultural work, and so this was very animated. I really believe that in a region that's so culturally diverse, the cross-cultural currents, and we were talking about this a uh, little with several of them, yes, uh, uh, during our refreshments before, and I think that all of that work that the Arts Council here is doing with the folk arts and dealing with local communities to engage them in all sorts of cultural practices, I think is such an important part so that all of us can learn and be part of community in, in different ways. Um, this is a little bit of a, and there, there it is at night. Now, I need to check with Isha to see how we're doing on time because I have, is I, okay, terrific, terrific. I don't want anybody to be here. <laughs> okay. uh, I want to tell you a story of reconciliation that may drive this point that I was making earlier, um, make it a little bit stronger. I remember I got a call from a, uh, from a curator who very much wanted to do a bit of the uh, Lenape Delaware people from who were indigenous to this area in New Jersey and New York. And this was a community that then spread out to eastern and western Oklahoma, to Wisconsin, and, and into Canada. And he wanted to do this um, incredible Lenape exhibition. Well, our exhibition calendar was filled, jam-packed. We couldn't do it. So we made a couple of calls to the Ellis Island uh, National uh, Museum of Immigration. Now this seems a little odd to have like a First Peoples exhibit at the Immigration Museum, although certainly there are transnational native people who are indigenous and living in our region, huge numbers. Uh, but they agreed to do it because they had also committed uh, the curatorial staff at Ellis Island Museum, which is a remarkable institution run by the National Park Service. They had done a major repatriation uh, ceremony, and they had a reunion, actually, of Delaware people from these different regions that I mentioned, Wisconsin, Canada, Eastern and Western Oklahoma. And it's one of the technical complications in repatriation work is competing claims and where would you bury the funereal remains or the human remains or, or anything that is required of NAGPRA legislation. The decision was made, pretty much consensus, but the decision was made to have that be buried, reburied on the grounds of Ellis Island. 
And so they had a big celebration to that effect. So there was already a comfort level at, the, at this museum, and they took the exhibit. And I was very proud of that and glad that this was the museum. It turned out that uh, one of the Dutch Reformed churches, because, you know, we are, New York City is framed as New Amsterdam, and there's a huge Dutch cultural influence in the built environment and in what New York City is, has become, and, and it also embodies a kind of idea of tolerance that we can trace back to Amsterdam and to the Dutch influence in the region. But one of the things that the elders of the of Marble Collegiate Church, they went to see this exhibit, and they were so moved by it that they went back to their congregation, and they made a decision as I understand and have been told, that they would do a formal reconciliation and apology to the native people of our region. And so they did that. And they happened to do it, and I remember the day, it was the day after Thanksgiving in the year 2009. Now this was the first year of Obama's presidency. And you may remember that there was a some fanfare about the creation of Indigenous Peoples Day on the Friday after Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving itself having been a very culturally loaded holiday. We have so many culturally loaded holidays in, in our in our country, right? So what they did, they contacted and they got the, the permit from the New York City Parks Department and on the cobblestones uh, in front of the museum, they had this um, this apology ceremony and hundreds of people showed up. And I believe that they made their best effort to reach out to indigenous communities and community members and native people in the region. Did they do a perfect job of it? I'm not really, I can tell you other stories, but not from this lecture. But they did a pretty good job. And at the time, there was a very uh, prominent Native American leader, Curtis Zuniga, who had been the Delaware chief of the Eastern Band Oklahoma. He was based in Marlesville, Oklahoma. And Curtis Zuniga at the time had been appointed to work for the Department of Commerce because he was working on the 2020 census and having every Native person counted in the census was very important. So Curtis, uh, uh, he agreed to come up to this, being a Delaware leader, and he was a speaker, being a fluent Delaware speaker himself, and so there was a ceremony. And the ceremony was to give this formal apology, and in Chief Zuniga's response, he basically said, we'll move forward from here. He's very incredibly gracious about it. But he said, we can never forget what happened. And this is the devastation of this, uh, this through, through history of to my people. And so he honored the truth of that uh, historic record and memory. But at the but the idea that he bought into was the idea of reconciliation and peace. And to me, this was one of the most heartfelt moments that I've ever had in my career. Because at the end, there were two, I guess they were like nine years old. There was a, there was a, a, a young Dutch girl in the gale of her cultural outfit. And there was a young native mom, a young girl, who was in Indian. And the two children, they removed their cultural necklaces and put them on the chair. And the moment was so, this is, this is out of doors. This is on what a lot of people, it's a shopping thing. It's what Black Friday is, the big, you know, it's all about. The place was visibly moved by this cultural expression. And I felt that if the museum can, in its work, motivate people to take an action that is that culturally profound and something is going on. I want to talk briefly about some of the great work that some Native American organizations throughout the country are doing. The Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums, these are all very young organizations formed within the last so ATOM started out as a small organization, and now they now have upwards of 750 people in the conference. My mom and I 
I'm speaking there in Albuquerque uh, in early October. But they're very much uh, an organization that is uh, developing a field and understanding that uh, native organizations, most of these are community-based, tribal-based organizations, that they do need some technical help, whether it's in you know, their email or some people conservation or exhibition presentation and climate control and disaster preparedness or cultural protocols or working with elders in the communities, authors in the communities, you name it, all of those things are very important. This form is one of the robust uh, discourses in the country. It definitely has a First Nations perspective to it. And one of the things that, um, that has been important to us is that some of the dedicated funding through federal agencies in particular, like the Institute of Museum and Libraries and Museums, um, has been at the table and really providing a lot of help to uh, Native organizations. I find that uh, it is uh, very focused on intellectual and it's very focused on policy and, uh, and practicalities, but also a very important cultural form. Likewise, the Native American Indigenous Studies Association, which I will assume that there are uh, faculty members and workers who are members of this membership organization, the Native American Indigenous Studies Association, which started just 10 years ago, they now attract an audience of Indigenous from all over the world, but principally from the U.S. and Canada, for our national conference. And papers are presented to young scholars, very young, just, you know, like uh, in four-year colleges or even two-year colleges, but then some extraordinary uh, academic papers presented by some of the top scholars in the field, both indigenous and young. I think that these kind of institutions can, that can help raise the public awareness about uh, indigenous practice and really build a field and build a network is very important to the development intellectually and culturally of this, of this field. I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot of both the uh, eight long and the American Indigenous Studies Association. Another organization that uh, was uh, started with seed money from the fourth is the Native Arts and Culture Foundation. And I did read a handout, uh, which each of you would like to review, but it gives all of these resources. So if you're, if you're interested in, in the deeper dialogue on any of these subjects, then certainly you can see some of the work that the Native Arts and Culture Foundation, including images and artwork made by artists and the resident fellows. They also have, um, have developed throughout the country, community inspiration projects where contemporary artists appear in community settings to be really uh, interesting and highly engaging for them. Let me check it out. I don't know if I should go on and on. I want to be respectful of that. Yeah. Uh, why, don't, why don't I leave it there? Yes. Okay. So the, uh, her question, I'll repeat it you know, for the for the tape here and everyone, is like, uh, so what's correct in using, how did you using Native American, American Indian, Native peoples? I've made a lot of different references uh, to that. And I had told a quick story of uh, being corrected by one of our visitors who said, no, it's not Eskimos, it's Inuit. And I said, you know, it's both because there are both Eskimo people and Inuit. And I don't know where the idea that Eskimo was derogatory or wrong term, it's a cultural term. It was amazing because our predecessor institution, based uh, before the National Museum of the American Indian was established, was the High Center at 155th and Broadway, and it was the Museum of the American Indian. Now, I will tell you, I understand 
that in using, we, we adopted the same terminology from the Museum of the American Indian, and there was some much debate about whether in Latin American countries, if this was a term of derision, that it was inappropriate of using Indian or Indio as, a, as, as this was a kind of disrespectful term in, in some Latin American uh, communities. So we had that, uh, we had a lot of conversation about it, and we decided to stay with the National Museum of the American Indian. In practice, uh, my colleagues over the years have used Native people, Indigenous people, knowing that in Canada the term usually is First People, First Peoples. In uh, Australia, we've done a lot of work. We're not our institution is not a, about Australia or New, Ze New Zealand, but we've used Aboriginal uh, in the whole uh, cultural studies field of looking at indigeneity and what that means and who is indigenous and who is native to an area. Those are uh, in land-based ideas. So I found that it was very much reciprocal that uh, sometimes we would, we had Native People's Magazine, we had American Indian Magazine, we had, you know. So I think that it's not been, um, it's not been problematic for us to use a variety of terms. I hope that answers. Yes, I'm seeing a hand right back there, and then you. Yes. Yes, um, let me try to paraphrase the question a little bit. Given the, the economic reality of many Native communities being in deep poverty, and by the way, just as an aside, um, there is disparity within Native communities because some tribes have mineral rights or gaming revenues or whatever, that, that or, or they're more urbanized or in, in that sense. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of dislocation within the communities, and you're absolutely right. That is a, a very complicated. Is what we're doing on such a middle class or intellectual level that it is not as inclusive as it could be or should be? And how do we? What are the remedies for dealing with that? Well, one of the remedies, and it was a legislative one, was that in creating. A national institution, and I didn't go into the history of why didn't the whole museum just move to Washington and leave New York behind. It couldn't because there was um, there was in the New York charters it was a, a chartered in the state of New York, and it was the uh, wishes of the uh, of, of, of the people that created the museum that it would be based in New York. So getting the politics of getting the uh, congressional delegation and the mayor and the governor and the attorney general on board to even allow the museum what would be the political compromise. So the compromise was there will be a significant permanent facility in New York and there will be the National Museum established in Washington which would be the headquarters and the collection would move. So that was, that was a very quick thumbnail sketch of the politics of that. Knowing that this is a very diverse um, hemisphere and knowing that you've got the country's political center and arguably the country's financial and cultural center in Washington, D.C. and New York City, how could we get not only the approval from legislators who, from, who are from rural states or from the West or wherever, and, the, and I believe the compromise in that language was to create something that for years we called the fourth museum. So here were the three facilities, and then there was this community outreach work that was very invested in the proactive work in 
repatriation and community building, but also in traveling exhibits. So I didn't show you any of the uh, more panel show exhibits because I will tell you one of the things, and it's a, it's a remarkable challenge, in theory it would be great to have the Arctic material go back to uh, Alaskan villages or in British Columbia in the north, but in, in reality that's an extremely expensive endeavor. So some of the things that have been done in terms of making our collections accessible to other regions of the country, we have done long-term extended loans to the Seminole community in, in, in southern Florida. Oh my God, I'm hoping it's all okay. Uh, but a significant part of the Seminole collection was sent there for the new Native American Cultural and Heritage Center that's uh, in the works for Oklahoma City. There'll be a significant number of objects that will be on, on long-term loan to that institution. And for the Anchorage Museum, uh, both the Natural History Museum uh, the National Museum of Natural History in Washington and the National Museum of the American Indian both loan on long-term long loans of significant collections to that region. Now, on the more simple practical side, I will tell you, organizing traveling exhi exhibitions, I don't know how many in this room have been involved in the actual work of doing that, it is enormously complicated. and. To, to make it work is very hard. So our way of doing that is kind of reciprocal. We've allowed and invited, not allowed, that's the wrong word, we've invited uh, Native communities to have cultural ceremonies and performances in the, in the mall in Washington, D.C. But we've also had some panel shows. The shows are more topical. There's one of the most uh, popular exhibits, which has traveled all over the country. In fact, there had to be two, two um, a copy, a duplicate made of it, so that two of them could tour at once. And it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was a show about African Native Americans. So the whole uh, discourse of people of mixed cultural heritage who have both African American and Native American backgrounds, this was quite a remarkable exhibit that has toured all over the country. And I remember uh, I was reading and I saw, because it's I'm, I'm from Eastern Oklahoma, as I mentioned, and I, not that I know prior Oklahoma so well, but it's, it's within an hour drive of where my family is from. And I was saying, really? They're going to take the African Native American exhibit in prior Oklahoma? They did, and they, it was a huge success there. So that's toured, and we did an exhibit about Native American veterans. We've done um, some exhibits about, uh, uh, in collaboration with the Postal Museum on stamps and coins. We've done other kinds of, uh, uh, and more elaborate traveling exhibits. Uh, it's not to address your point about the inclusion and reaching out to the most grassroots of Native communities, but I know that uh, Kate Walking Stick, who was a long time affiliated, and there are great uh, works of hers in the Montclair Museum here in New Jersey, and she's one of the just spectacular Native artist, and her show, which with great fanfare and wonderful catalog, great essays, it is one of those sort of major museum shows. So it's gone uh, to Ohio, and it'll go to Tulsa, and it's, I think it went to the Herd uh, uh, to the Herd Museum in Phoenix. So we so the museum has done a lot of work like that. We also have sent, for example, when the uh, there was a very elaborate. Navajo Weaving Show, and it was the first, it was one of the first shows that I was involved with when I joined the staff in 1995. And so we decided to take this remarkable Navajo Weaving Show, but before we even started really seriously developing the content for the show, we took uh, several of the historic uh, blankets and we had a gathering and some 300 Navajo weavers showed up for it in in Arizona. And then one of the things we, it was such a popular show that it ended up touring throughout South America. Lesson learned there, different humidity, different insects, different complications. And in order to travel the show, after every venue in South America, it had to be flown back to Washington, D.C. It had to be treated, all of this, because this is among 
the, some of the most extraordinary cultural material in our country. It is like of a cultural uh, history in our country that is so important. So protecting the stewardship of those, uh, of, of those blankets was very important. And partly we did that exhibit, it was bilingual in Navajo and English, and we combined it with contemporary Navajo reading show in New York, so we had, we had a great collection of contemporary readings. But this was the show that opened in Window Rock, Arizona, it opened the Navajo Nation Museum. And the lesson learned there, it was with great fanfare because they had the Navajo Fair, they had the Navajo Parade, and this was a very big deal for this tribal museum to open its doors. One of the things that we didn't think through enough in the beginning, but we, it got our attention very quickly, was that they were so proud, they painted the facility the off gas from the paint created a conservation challenge, huge. The fact is that they had incredible community people, but was it at a level of security that would meet the protocols and standards of the Smithsonian? And it was not. So we had to figure out ways to negotiate uh, those efforts. So community-based work is 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 time consuming it's a huge amount of resources to do it well uh, i remember because we were so committed to having community-based conversations and getting input well who does the inviting and who does the convening and where is it held and who is at the table and who isn't and how skilled are the people from the museum staff to be able to have the kind of conversation that would really draw out the best advice from a local community. I think if any of you have been in any university bureaucratic meetings, you will know that this is no, this is no small hat trick in, uh, in an area where a lot of people are in basic agreement and have kind of a way of working. Working with this level of diversity and cultural specificity is very complicated. I will also tell you that one of the uh, in incredible parts of uh, Native communities is that there's often a split between the elected and political leadership of a tribe and the tradition bearers, the cultural bearers, who have bring a different cultural participation and contribution to the community. So sorting out all of those uh, sticky issues, it's not, it's not so easy. But I think that the National Museum of the American Indian brings a lot of commitment and a lot of heart to that work. And I also think that there are people at the museum staff and on its trustees who are very deeply aware of the very issue that you put on the table and that disparity and being as inclusive as possible. And the realization that while the legislation that created NMEI was very much, it was going to be a Native institution and Native voice. It was very much about the Native perspective and worldview and the interpretation and, and um, how things were done. It even went so far as to uh, say that on the board, the trustees, that it would be, um, that that advisory board would be largely Native, most significantly Native. So it was, in a way, it's a counterpoint to the years and years of mainstream institutions that had not really been so open to having Native participation directly. I mean, I think just back to, I'm a huge fan of the Whitney Museum. I love going there. It's like, it's terrific. Really, it's terrific. But I also know that even the New York Times, which can sometimes be a pretty elite newspaper, okay, they were very critical, even Times was critical, of how diminished the Native American presence and then who was presented there. And I will tell you, part of what has inspired me and stimulated me over the years, I mean, this, this year, and the Whitney Museum, there is um, a Jimmy Durham show. Jimmy Durham, as I best understand, is not tribally recognized. He's not 
he's not enrolled in his tribal community that he claims, and yet is one of the significant global artists whose work, and he worked for the uh, American Indian Movement, AIM, and he has great experience, and his work is very much a deep commentary on the social and political realities of Native life and expression. And the Hammer Museum, one of the most significant museums in the country based in the Los Angeles area, mounted one of the most elaborate uh, exhibitions that I have ever seen of any artist, Indian or non-Indian, of any artist. And that exhibition will be opening at the Whitney Museum, I believe, later this fall. I wanted to call everyone's attention to the whole fact that I know, and this is part of the cultural specificity, and we get we get darts thrown at us for political correctness, whatever, on all of this discourse. But I know that there are artists that are more inclined to have something that is taking on the larger political issues through the work. And I, I totally, I understand that. And I think that I, I can use as a counterpoint Martin Puryear's work, very prominent African-American artist, and, Mar and, and uh, Mel Edwards' work, also a prominent African-American artist. Mel Edwards' work is very much about the discourse of slavery and all of the uh, symbolism and, uh, and, and the cultural language of that. And the other artist, it's formality. And it's so, the whole thing, I've heard conversation ad nauseum about where artists are looking in the mirror and saying, am I a Native American artist or am I an artist who happens to be Native American? So like anyone in the art world or whatever their cultural background, they're wanting recognition, good reviews, gallery sales, um, being part of an art world. And these are very complicated and sticky issues. I've been in, in forums with contemporary Native artists who said, wait a minute, we're not getting the recognition at the Metropolitan Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, the San Francisco Museum, and the LA County Museum. We deserve the recognition. We're at a level and caliber of our art making to do that. And there are institutions that are leading the way. One of them, and I put it on the, on the list of resources, is the Brooklyn Museum. The Brooklyn Museum, and I might add the New York Museum, they've redone the Native Galleries there. And I, understand, I haven't seen them yet, but I understand they're spectacular. The Brooklyn Museum is in their practice and commitment doing an extraordinary job, in my opinion, of really uh, negotiating some of these very complicated cultural issues. Just as an aside, although it's not, and it's also on the resource list, I am um, a huge fan of Brian Stevens, Brian Stevenson, whose book, Just Mercy, is an absolute must read. This is the man who exonerated uh, prisoners on death row and incarcerated people and has become an advocate for them and has developed the lynching project in uh, Alabama. And what he's done is he's identified every county in the entire country that had a lynching, which went on from the 1870s until 1955, I believe. And so when a county can reclaim its history, he has the symbolic tree-like uh, from the lynchings that don't touch the ground. And when the county then, in America, and there's several in New York State, reclaim that history then he will remove, have, the, uh, have that particular tree removed from the installation in Alabama. And his idea, and I think this was precursor because he was doing this work before we had all of the conversation about the Robert E. Lee uh, monuments and statues all over the country and all of that, but he was saying, walking around in an Alabama city and seeing all these markers that tell one frame of history and one interpretation of that history and not giving honor to multiple perspectives is just plain wrong. And so how did he go about remedying this is he took his practice as a lawyer, Harvard lawyer, who made his life to have people exonerated from, from 
who were innocent, and he would work to prove that innocence to get them off of uh, out of incarceration. And he's really taking on as a leadership. I hope that some of these great ideas that come out of that kind of practice will inform, and I'm sure they will, for the Native American Veterans uh, Memorial, which is being launched on, on Veterans Day of this year. So there's a lot of work uh, in this. I hope that tonight I've been able to give you some of the nuances and complexities of the work and draw on my own life and experiences of doing that work. And I think that's been helpful. Any last questions? And then we'll, yes. They have, the museum decided uh, in Washington, we had a, an entire symposium with, uh, informed by scholars, by advocates in the field of saying this is wrong. One of them is a, a brilliant uh, Native woman, Suzanne Harjo, who is really from the Morning Star Institute, and she's been on the topic, especially with the team in Washington, D.C., about this very derogatory name and it was uh we had a day where the museum looked at this not in a partisan political way but rather in the cultural read of it and just what is the lay of the land in this and it was a remarkable conversation and the in the breathtaking moment of that day there was a young man i assume he was about 18 or 19 he was just visiting the museum in Washington that day, and he had on a ball cap of that team. And he just showed up, you know, and everybody was actually, we're, we're mostly polite people at the museum. They're really, like, welcoming. We try to be hospitable people. Anyway, he was so moved from what he heard at the symposium that in the Q&A section, he came up to the podium, he removed the hat, ball cap, and said he never thought of these issues in quite this way and how, you know. So it is the stereotypes in our culture and who owns that uh, and how we deal with that. Um, I know that in some of our opening exhibits, there were all these kind of uh, little toys and things that we could say contradict, you know, like they're, they're, they're really not respectful culturally, and how do we turn it on its side and say, let's use that? And I know that the museum's director, Kevin Gover, has told many stories of going to, like the, um, whether it's boarding schools, going to the missions in California, and just seeing how deep this uh, stereotypes are, because we're all informed by the popular culture we're all informed by Hollywood movies and how Indians are presented in those movies, uh, how children, you know, I remember one of the Native staff members uh, at my institution, and he's a very tall, large Ojibwe man with long black hair and um, just so proud of his culture and so informed. And little children, children visiting the museum in classes would come up and say, uh, did, you, did you know any of the pilgrims? And it's just remarkable. I, I, it's like an art link letter. What kids say the darnest thing. But where do they get that in the first place? And we're very self-selecting because people come with their own ideas of, of culture. And, you know, and I've, I've, I've had very well-meaning, wonderful volunteers at the institution would say to a Native staff member, well, now are you going to wear your costume? Um, and it's like, costume, this is like... So So there's so much, and, and the way that we are dealing with that as an institution is we, we went through, and there was a, a, not a formal study, but it was pretty thorough. We looked at all of the textbooks in high schools around America, all the textbooks we could get our hands on. And the number of stereotypes in the textbooks and how the history was being incorrectly taught, we realized what a, what a big job that we had to do. The kind response to that was, 
we need to meet our visitors where they are. We have to realize that, yes, we're a native institution, but yes, we're also a mainstream institution because the great majority of our visitors are not Native American people. They're visitors from all over the world, from various and diverse cultural backgrounds, but they come to us with certain assumptions and learning and their own ideas of what's Native and what's appropriate and all that. And without going overboard just to take a position and say, well, we're going to be very politically correct. And no, it's not about political correctness. It's about the facts. It's about the history. But when you have, and it's changing because of the internet, when you have a board of uh, educators in the state of Texas, which has so much power in the textbook industry and has such an ideology that's driving that uh, development, in practical terms, what do you do about it? Because the problem is of such grandeur and enormity that to take it on is hard. So the way that we've done at the National Museum of American Indian is to develop curricula, to develop workshops that can be modeled by other organizations. We will, I'm, I'm presenting at the ATOM, the Tribal Archive Library and Museum Conference, and many of these institutions are involved in education. They have influence in their local communities. So the head of education of NMEI and one of the uh, people that works in curriculum development will be presenting with me on the topic of Native Knowledge 360 to say, what are some ways that we can deal with this in bite-sized pieces? Because the enormity of that task to change a curriculum, any of you who are educators in the education faculty here at Rutgers or any other place, it is not easy work, but you have to start someplace. And I do believe the building block, bite-sized pieces, is the way to do it. But I also believe that stepping back from something and looking at the metrics, really looking at the raw data and trying to get a grip on that, understand the enormity, so you can describe uh, describe the issue in um, more pragmatic terms that will will put you on a path of changing something. Anything else? We have one more, and then you should. Yes, you get the final word. <laughs> Okay, so the question, okay, okay, great. So you, you, you can have a follow-up question as well. So the question is, who, who gets to be an Indian? Who is acknowledged as a Native person for the conversation? And in, the, in this, one of the things that at the National Museum of the American Indian, and this was a topic that was discussed at great depth and length, and leaders like Suzanne Harjo and the founding director, Rick West, dealt with the issue of, of tribal um, enrollment. And one of the things is that uh, the person's name will be listed. They wanted to give the authorship to an exhibition to so that it's not some anonymous person that's the curator. It's who wrote this text label? Who wrote this? And so it was like um, the person's name and then in parentheses, their tribal affiliation. So partly, this is a very complicated, you have, you've raised a very central and complicated issue because how does the enrollment work then in state recognized tribes that are not also federally recognized? How does this work with artists like Jimmy Durham that I, I mentioned before, who is, uh, as I understand it, is not formally enrolled in a tribe, but has been very active in, in Native affairs for years. Or a friend of my a colleague at the museum who she herself had one Native and one non-Native parent. She married a man from another tribe and one of the, one, whichever the tribes, one of them was matrilineal and one was patrilineal, their son, do the math, three plus, their son was not recognized in either his mother's or his father's tribe. So because of the definition of who is in the community is a community decision. So the decision was a 
was a more a stricter definition, more narrow definition in those two communities than in many other Native communities. But that's a reality, and those, those issues, and I think one of the things, and I look around our great, our great region here, and we have people from great diverse backgrounds who come from, you know, I mean, I've, I've watched those ads, and I, I mean, I'm just amazed at in Ancestors.com, and then here's the guy that like is talking about later hose hosen and then he's he's in a Scottish you know with a bagpipe I mean you know gee wow so uh, how how is that and I say well he got that acknowledged on a website and took the test with the DNA and, and is now proudly Scottish and Irish that's his choice you know but but it but you do raise an issue and I know that um, there is a, uh, a native artist who, for his own reasons, he didn't believe in the tribal enrollment system. It was uh, Willard Stone, who's a very prominent sculptor, wood sculptor, and he had a show at the uh, Gilcrease Museum in Tulsa. He didn't have the tribal enrollment. What do you do? So, you know, so many of these are tribal. It's basically the easiest answer to the question, the very good question, is the community decides who can be a member of the community. It's the community's decision. But that sometimes contradicts the individual. And you know, you have in the public discourse, you have all sorts of challenges, and you have many, uh, many things like, well, this person doesn't look like an enemy. Well, what does that mean? You know, it's, 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 it's very complicated. Follow up question. Thank you. Yes. Wow. Well, and it's, you know, well, and you know, and the whole tribal recognition and enrollment is not so much a practice in Latin America and Mexico. And I remember when we did, we did two exhibits of, indi of indigenous communities from Mexico. And I remember working with the uh, cultural office and the embassy, and I found that in our region, in our region, there were a half million people of Mexican descent, a half million in this greater tri-state region, okay? Of the 500,000, I'll get to you in just a moment, of the 500,000, it's my understanding that one third, or 135,000 roughly, were from indigenous communities, Pueblo, and so forth. So in doing, in figuring out, because I, I make a joke about uh, a building that's so glorious like this, and I say, well, you know, we're suffering from an edifice complex, right? You're supposed to laugh, ha uh -huh. Okay, it's true. It has its own cultural barrier because it's a big, fancy, architecturally significant landmark building and how do we as museum professionals break down that wall partly you saw in the images i showed you we take the museum outside partly we take exhibits on tour partly we do all sorts of things with communities but it's uh and and i am proud of the fact that in the first year of operation this museum had over 10 times the audience that had ever been attracted to the museum at 155th Street. Now, I also know because in central Harlem, where that's based, there was a lot of political discomfort in the fact that a cultural institution 
was being extracted out of the Harlem community and put in the financial district. Can you imagine what the local elected officials would, would be saying or doing to advocate for their neighborhoods? So getting the agreement on even making a move like that, and I will tell you, I'm proud of the fact that this museum now attracts, it's one of the top 10 museum destinations in our region. Now, we're not in the MoMA or Natural History or Metropolitan Museum realm, but having close to 600,000 visitors a year is pretty damn good. But your point also about the Latin American and tribal recognition, this is, it saddens me to hear this story. Because I know in the meantime we've done, uh, there was an extraordinary exhibit that opened about a year ago in Washington on the Inca Road. And I know that we've had cultural presentations and video in the villages throughout a lot of South American and uh, Latin American countries. So there's still a lot of work to do. And along the way, I'm sure, like as you described to me, there have been some disconnects in that and probably some blunders. So, you know, I'm sorry to hear it. Yeah, exactly. We have one more question, and then I'm, they're going to put the hook on me and pull me off the stage. Yes. Yes. Yes, it's at the base of Broadway. So it's if if you ever taken the Staten Island Ferry, it's three blocks north of the Staten Island Ferry stop. It's very much downtown. Um, down, Lower Manhattan has become its own cultural hub. Well, you know, it, it's interesting because conflating that the move was from 155th to Lower Broadway, that wasn't the move. The move was the institution being primarily based in Washington, D.C. And then actually the story, which I'll tell very quickly, the story of how we ended up with the Custom House, there were many heroes in that. Uh, Senator Moynihan was one of them, but David Rockefeller leaned on then President Ronald Reagan to get a sweetheart deal, really, in a federal building that had been vacated for 25 years because the Custom House had been moved, that agency had been moved to the brand new World Trade Center. So this was a, as they say, a white elephant building in Lower Manhattan. It was vacated for 25 years. I believe that if it were not for the efforts of Jacqueline Kennedy, Onassis, and Brendan Gill, and the fact of the horror show in New York City that Penn Station had been torn down, that there was a new respect that the city woke up to say, we have to respect and save historic buildings. And the Custom House, in terms of the federal portfolio of architecture, it is the fourth most prominent federal building in the country. The first is the White House, the Congress, and the Supreme Court building are the one, two, and three. Number four is this building. So when you're there, and go, please. Take a really close look. It is a Cass Gilbert building. This is a remarkable American architect. Uh, it is so significant. Cass Gilbert did a lot of work in New York. This was his, he was based in St. Paul, Minnesota. This was his first major commissioning. It changed his career. Shortly thereafter, the next big Cass Gilbert building in this region was the Woolworth building. There you have it. Okay, that's it. That's all, that's all we do.